Nelson Mandela once said that it's in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. But these hands don't feel big enough to hold on to that much hope for years. It feels like we've been pulling rope in a game of tug of war, and each time the odds are less on our side, these hands forget that they hold power. In order to create a better world for all who live in it, I have to live knowing that my life matters just as much as the lives I live next to these hands. These hands are tired from shaking others that question how firm my grip is. They are bruised from constantly trying to get a grip after some firm tells me that I wasn't firm enough in the meeting. But if I talk more sternly, it can be mistaken for getting too worked up and this type of work don't pay enough each day. I'm reminded that I'm the sequel of people who paid ways, handed me a blueprint, and hand in hand prayer we prayed that I won't be treated different. Even though I may look different or love differently than they do, these hands, these hands have turned prune from constantly being the only hands of his kind in the room. They don't type at the right pace or write the right words so things always go left. See, I've tried to not overstep, but these feet took me to places that my great grandmas didn't make it far enough to see. I still follow in her footsteps. She cleaned for a living, just to straighten a message she's never made. It's funny that you may call her that, but she taught my family that sometimes you have to finish things you never started. Sometimes you have to fix the very things that try to break you and do it with a type of dignity that can move past it, even without getting over on the very people who made it get to this point in the first place. It's no surprise that she would hum Amazing Grace right in the face of iniquity. She knew that she would find people who were once lost. She would give sight to the blind. She sang because her sweet sound would save a wretch like me. She taught me that these feet can walk over any feet that these feet can walk into a room without ever getting invited in, take a seat at the table just to go back home and build its own so I'm minding my black owned business. My common sense just made me tired of being your token. Now these feet touch cold wooden forts at 6 a.m. after my hands have wiped off any remaining sleep. I start prepping for the work day just in time to save. I shower off yesterday's opposition and clothe myself in the optimism of today. Past heartaches can only motivate me harder. In doing so, I honor those who are okay with being the first, even if they were looked at last. What if ceilings were never made of, of glass? What if ceilings were not really made at all? What if we had, the sky had no limit, just fly? What if to be, what if to be human meant that you don't have to second guess your being no matter what rooms you be in? What if we can go back to the beginning of how this all came to be? So when I leave my house for the morning commute, I do it to break bread and commune with my community. And I, and I hum, Amazing grace will I save. Thank you. That was incredible, Justice. Thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for coming. Welcome to the College of Business um, MLK panel, Authenticity at Work. I'm the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. Dr. Olivia La Del Rosso, and thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled to have my friends Adonis Wooten Heron and Justice Davis here with us today to share about their experiences navigating the workplace and life through their various identities. This panel is in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. His leadership in the civil rights movement still inspires us today to fight for justice. We must recognize, however, that the College of Business and Kansas State University, the place that we learn, this place that we're sitting here today, it exists on land that is the ancestral territory of many indigenous nations. The land we learn on was once the home of many native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. The 1982 Morrill Act, that created K-State as a land-grant institution, removed these Native people from Kansas, and the land was sold to fund the founding of this university. We are proud that as a first land-grant university, we exist to provide educational access to everybody. However, just like all stories, there are many sides of that story. And ours exists within ongoing settler colonialism and rests on the disposition of indigenous peoples and nations from their lands. I ask that we, as individuals and as a university, can, can consider how can we center indigenous voices 
support Indigenous-owned businesses and educational opportunities. Justice and Adonis, they are themselves advocates for many identities that they identify with and those that they don't identify with. And today, we're all here representing ourselves, right? So we're gonna be talking a lot about our experiences, um, how we identify, and how that has impacted our work and how we navigate work, right? Um, we're not here representing the companies that we work for, the really cool companies that they work for, by the way. Um, these are our personal experiences, um, and some of that we'll, we'll also be talking about the intersectionalities of those. So for a little background, and then we're gonna get started. Um, as you know, Justice is a queer spoken word poet. She's pretty incredible, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So she graduated in May 2016 from K-State Marketing and Communications. Um, while she was at K-State, she served as the president of our award-winning Black Student Union. Yes, she co-founded Conversation Cafe on Race and Inclusion in partnership with Leadership Studies and served as the chair for the Big 12 Council on Black Student Government, which is actually taking place here at K-State in February. We're excited to host that. Um, these roles sparked her passion around community activism and manifest in both her creative and corporate career. Right now, she lives in um, Los Angeles, California, and she's the brand manager for Mega Mex Foods, managing the holy guacamole and avocado brands um, with, within Hormel Foods. We also are excited to have Adonis Wooten Heron here, also a really good friend of, of mine and of the university. So he also is born and raised in Kansas, also a 2016 K-State marketing graduate. He has over six years of experience in sales, leadership territory management, talent acquisition, DEI programming, with several Fortune 500 companies. Right now, he serves as the North American recruiting pillar lead for people with disabilities and LGBTQ plus in collaboration with their regional recruiting teams, Adonis helps define, implement, track, and measure nationwide, regional, and local inclusion and diversity plans in alignment with their North American recruiting priorities. He has led millions of dollars worth of sales business, led the North American talent acquisition strategy, led diversity growth year over year, and he's relocated a bunch of times. He's lived all over the US. So I'm really excited to have um, these two young alumni here, I really hope that as young alumni, you're gonna identify with some of their experiences. And as students, can this, will, this conversation will help you think about what is it gonna be like navigating the workplace as you go into um, your future internship or careers. So I wanna start by just asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself and why the topic that we have today of authenticity at work, why is that important to you? For sure. I just want to say, I, I like to have a good time, right? And it feels very, like, official. Like, it feels like, no, I, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, but I like to have a good time. I feel like I'm amongst friends and family, and that's the whole purpose of this conversation, right? Yes. Being authentic and showing that in the space. But Olivia has laid out my career pr pretty excellently. Okay. It's been a hot mess, but it's been a great <laughs> hot mess. Um, but throughout that journey in my career, um, especially early on, and we'll talk a little bit about our journeys in, in college and how we've grown, we've known each other for a decade, it's been so important for me to not just show up and do the work that I do, but to actually show up and be comfortable doing that work, right? And so when you talk about authenticity, we always go down to the business benefit of why that's important is if I can't show up or, or choose how I show up in a way that's authentic, I'm not going to produce a result that's going to provide any type of business benefit. I have a feeling that I'm going to be working for a long time, right? I got to buy a house. I got a dog to take care of. Groceries, uh, eggs are $12,000. <laughs> um, so in my mind, feeling that I'm going to be working for a long time, it would be sad to look back on a 30, 40 year career and realize that I was never myself in that space. And so however we can find those spaces or prioritize that in our journeys, which we'll talk about today, that's why it matters, right? That's why it's so important. And that's why that authenticity to me is something that I stand on in my day-to-day -day advocacy work, as well as just how I show up in life in general. Awesome. Adonna set the stage. Um, it's awesome being here and being, seeing all these faces in the room, especially on a, what time is it, 4 p.m.? 
um, on a Thursday, so thank you for being here. Um, and it was hilarious watching your faces when I was up here, and like I knew you guys were like asking, like, what, what is she doing? <laughs> this is intense right now. Uh, it was like, welcome to my TED Talk, essentially. Uh, <laughs> but um, yes, uh, I, I can't wait to have this conversation and dig deep, but who am I? I'm a spoken word poet, queer, um, and then brand manager, and uh, a lot of those, those titles come with different perspectives. And I think when I think about why authenticity matters to me, in the poem, one of the things that I talked about was my great-grandmother. And my grandmother, great-grandmother, she didn't have to work because she had a husband um, who held down the household and wanted her to be at home with their eight kids. They had a lot of kids back in the day. And they were way poorer than I was. So shout out to them for making it through. But when she decided to go into the work field, she became a maid. And a lot of us would look at that and say, OK, like, you know, that's, that's not the most elegant title to have. But then I started to like reflect and say, oh my gosh, me and my great-grandmother have a lot in common, right? To clean up messes that we necessarily didn't make, right? Um, to, to follow after someone and picking up those pieces, fixing things that you didn't necessarily break. And so for me, if I think about how my great-grandmother uh, faced some of those challenges in her work, right? And also cleaning after people that don't look like you. Ooh, that's, that's tough. To also relate to someone who may not want to relate to you because you have to be in their home. And so for me, it's like if my great grandmother was able to be herself and do all those things in that time period, why can't I? Uh, it, my, one of my spiritual leaders, he said a quote recently. He said, don't destroy something that you worked. No, don't rebuild. Don't rebuild something you worked so long to destroy. So what that means to me is like I, I worked so hard to destroy some of those stereotypes that I was um, pr imprisoned by. I worked so hard to destroy the idea of having to try to fit in and be somebody I'm not. So at this point in my, in my life, I'm not trying to rebuild that. So that's why authenticity is so important to me. So what you just shared, it makes me think about how we have these ideas about professionalism. Like these are expectations of like, this is what you should wear. These are the things that you should do, right? And we create them kind of as guideposts. Like we do teach literally in the College of Business, like here's what we recommend that you consider and like get some business um, professional outfits and this sort of thing. Um, and so we are creating uh, this, this idea of what we should be looking like, right? And the experiences that we should have. What I want, if you could talk a little bit about professionalism, those professional expectations and how can you do that while also being authentic and true to yourself, whether it's how you look, how you talk, the way that you engage, and the experiences that you have. I can go first on okay. this one. We're going to tag team who goes first. Yeah. Um, so this is interesting, because I don't think I got to this idea of really defining authenticity versus professionalism until about a couple years ago. Um, so I've been in the workforce now almost seven years, which is crazy, which means I graduated from K-State seven years ago, uh, almost. And that's, um, yeah, time goes by fast. But I would say, for, for me, authenticity is always operating in my deepest intention um, for myself. Like, what do I, like, if, if I find myself code switching, and if you don't know what code switching is, is to switch and play into some, into some type of code just to fit in into a space, right? Just to put that in layman's terms. But, um, but that's not my deepest intention. My deepest intention is to feel like I belong. I belong in a, in a group. And I can't belong being something I'm not, because I'm not really feeling that. I'm pretending to feel that. So for me, it's operating in the, my deepest intention to who I am, genuinely. So if it's I want to feel like I belong, or I want to feel heard, or respected, or valued, always operating in that, I can only do that if I'm being myself. Whereas professionalism, to me, is having emotional intelligence um, and respect for the room, right? To learn, learning how to effectively communicate. I can be myself and then have the emotional intelligence and not everyone communicates the way I, I, I do. No, not everyone feels love in the same way that I, I do. We talk about love languages, et cetera. So that's how I define the two. One's focused on respecting the room and having the emotional intelligence enough to be effective in that space. Authenticity is having respect for yourself um, to always operate in your deepest intention. So. Yeah, and that professionalism is such a subjective term, right? It's such a subjective conversation on what that is, and it's built on a bunch of ideals on what looks good, what's presented, all of those things, right? We can break all of that down, but operating from Justice's standpoint, and we're going to talk more about it, but that authenticity is from within, right? Who am I, right? What do I stand on? What are my values? What are my morals? What, what am I embodying, right? How do I stay true to that person, 
right, in a foundational standpoint. And I think we often, so times as we're gonna talk, so many times as we're gonna talk, is we give up that authenticity to fit into professionalism. Whereas they're not supposed to be in that type of regard, right? That's not how a career is supposed to work from my stance, is I'm gonna give up what's authentic to me and what's true to me to fit into that. But as I mentioned before, when you get to that, whatever that is, a 30-year career, a relationship that you want, and you look back on all of that time, you realize that I sacrificed one of the most important <laughs> things to yeah. get to this like point. Um, and, and for some people, it's worth it because that was a means of survival. Yeah. right? That was a means to get me to where I want to be. But when you start looking about how you show up, I have to be able to do that in a way that's real, mm -hmm. in a way that's honest, in a way that's true. Um, and when you're working with clients and when you're working with customers and when you're in the people business, I need to be able to get to that quickly. And so mm -hmm. authenticity is that within foundation that people can't really snatch from you, but you can choose to give it up, if that makes sense. Go ahead. This yeah. is a journey, right? Oh, go ahead, Justice. I was going to say, Donna said something that's super important about the idea of that self-assessment, asking yourself, yourself the right questions, because a lot of times... We have to unlearn, unfortunately, some of the things that we were passed down and taught, right? So for us, that could have been, you know what? You don't talk like professionalism. Like, you don't talk professional. What does that actually mean? Or you have to work twice as hard to get half of what someone else, is ha what, half of what someone else has, right? What does that really mean? And what does that do to the psyche when you internalize some of those things and you're told that, like, your natural being, you're just how you are inherently, your culture is not professional. And so when he talks about the subjectivity of professionalism, you have to do that self-assessment. OK, how am I bringing my own personal biases into this conversation? Because it's, it's a, a process, process of self-awareness constantly. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of dig deep on that, that point. And I think this is going to flow into what we're talking about. Yeah. But that's the conversation of self-actualization. If you've ever talked to me ever in your life, like if you ever came to me and you're like, <laughs> I need some advice, the first thing that I always tell you and, and the thing that I reiterate is, the issue that we have is we go to the workforce, we go to the career, we go to places for them to tell us who we are, mm. right? I'm going for you to tell me what I'm good at. I'm going for you to tell me what I deserve. I'm going to, to you to tell me how I should act. I'm going to you to tell me who I am. When we have that conversation, the thing that we need to do is be very sure of who we are. Right? And that's in any space. And I tell people, I do this analysis with everyone, right? Olivia, we've talked about it, we talk about it, and it's simple. I, I'm a big, draw it out person. What am I really good at? Like, what am I truly, really good at, right? What do I enjoy doing? Make a list. What do I enjoy doing? Who am I? Define that, right? Define that for yourself, believe it, sit on it. What do I really operate in those spaces? The more you sit on the fact of who you are, what you do, what you enjoy. Um, I'm not looking for you to tell me who I am in a career or a job or a person, but what I am looking for you is to partner with me in that authenticity to elevate who I am and what I'm great at, but also fill a gap that I have. Like, I'm going to the workforce for something. I'm going to this place for something. I'm embodying professionalism for something, right? Yeah. But I'm not going for you to tell me who I am. Absolutely. Right? And I think that's something that we have to be very cognizant of in any part. This could be a relationship. We were just talking about this. <laughs> yeah. A friendship. The moment you go ask somebody who you are and they give you that narrative, it becomes true to you. Mm -hmm. And you repeat that narrative, and that's who I am. And again, I say this all the time because I'm going to be working forever, but you're going to look back on 30 years and realize 25 of that 30, I was not even who I thought I was. And I think that's the importance of this conversation. We'll talk more about it is, is doing that self-assessment, having that self-actualization, but not looking to folks to tell you who you are, but to elevate who you are and help you then progress in that, uh, which is subjectively what professionalism could look like depending on where you are. Yep. So this is a journey. It has, it's taken us, you know, a lifetime, right, to get to where we're at, and it's gonna be a continuous journey. Can you talk about what you've learned related to understanding yourself and how to sit in your authentic self? Okay, like, can you look back at your past? Maybe it was your experience at K-State. Maybe it was, you know, in your first internship or job where maybe looking back on it, you're like, oh, like, I was giving up part of myself and not being true to myself because of the space that I was in and not having had the lived experience that I have now? First. Me first. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think back to my entire collegiate career, honestly. <laughs> like, let's, let's be real, you know, I, 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 my parents went to college later on in life and became successful, right? So I was kind of navigating it myself, and it goes back to what I was saying. I was waiting for someone to tell me what to do and how to be and how to act. And also, it, it comes with intersectionality of identity, and we talk about this uh, at all. My pronouns are he, him, I'm on the queer spectrum, right? Um, but having to deal with that journey in college without having the representation, trying to figure out actually who I am, heading into these very corporate spaces and these very corporate structures, it's a lot to deal with. Being successful in college, showing up for myself in that regard, taking care of my friends, going to school, staying enrolled, my God, paying the bills. <laughs> I was working like three jobs, honey, I was out of here. Um, but I look back to my entire collegiate career, which ended up being four and a half years, and that experience taught me quite a bit about all the time that I gave up. And right, I don't like to dwell in the past, but we always talk, if I would have done this then, I would be here now. But I look back to that experience, and I'm so glad that we're having this conversation, is to take those chances to get to know yourself in the moment, right? Take those chances to uncover who you are in that space. Again, so you're not going to people to tell you who you are, but you're knowing who that is. But that journey then continued into my corporate career. Um, I was at Hormel Foods before, the beloved starter of my career. I started in sales, didn't know what the hell I was doing in sales, child. I was down in Fort Worth, Texas, selling like meat to like <laughs> Dallas Cowboys State and barbecue places. It's me, like this black queer boy, like just doing God knows what, right? Make, trying to get people to understand and tell me who I am to find the right path and make it make sense. And I wasn't comfortable being out at work and I didn't have the tools or the language to talk about that. And so it made that early career journey just that much harder. But I think you get to a point, and I know that I got into a point, I think it was a territory manager in Birmingham, Alabama, and I had an experience where prejudice um, came into the conversation with, with a client and, and business that I was handling, and I had to stand very flat-footed in who I was, right? And what I was willing to accept, and was I willing to walk away to protect the authenticity of who I was? That was a pivotal point in my career because after I made it out of that situation, after fighting for a bit, I realized that I could never go back and get that time back, right? But I can start having that authentic conversation and that journey moving forward. And I did that all through corporate recruiting. I did that all through managing North American talent acquisition and now managing all of North American strategy for, for a tech firm globally, getting to that space. But we gave up a lot of time, right, to get there. Um, if I would have had this conversation then, it would have been a, a little bit easier. But it, it's that journey that we still don't have the answer, right? And we still don't know it all, and we're still navigating spaces yeah. as we get older, as we take on more business, as we're managing teams, as we're working with clients, as I'm entering into new spaces, figuring out how I want to show up, what level of authenticity I want to bring, what, what barriers I want to cross, and things like that. So it's definitely a continuous journey, but if I could get that time back, right, I could, I could take that. But I take that as a blessing and, and as a story to tell, for sure. Yeah, good. That's good. I think for me, my, my journey, our, our journey is very similar. Very similar. Um, I just got to a point, honestly, Olivia, where I was just tired of carrying shame. Um, I go back to childhood because I was a child, no, a lot of people are surprised at this, but I was a super shy kid, super, super shy kid. Um, you know, my parents had me really young and I was ashamed of that. So my parents had me, my mom was 15, my dad was 17, they were teenagers. Um, and so we relied heavily on my grandmother, my mother's mom, um, to really take care of us. And I didn't realize I was lower class until I went to suburban, uh, suburban uh, Overland Park. If anybody knows where Overland Park is, what that is, right? So I didn't realize I was lower class until then, but for so long I was ashamed of like, man, my parents are super young. Everyone else has these normal parents. Like why do, why do my parents have to look like this? Or why do we have to operate like this? Or why do we have to live in this type of house and everyone else lives over there? And, and then I'm, I was always the only in my class. So gosh, it just seems like, it seems like that culture over there has a little bit more um, elegance to them. Why are we like this, right? So I spent uh, adolescence, and not saying that my parents definitely tried to pour into me, my grandmother poured into me, but still it's like, you know, you, you, there's a gap, especially that young. You're just like, I'm seeing this, I know this, but I'm seeing this and there's a gap there. Um, so I was ashamed of that. Um, and then, oh gosh, I had these, I, these questions around my sexuality. So now I'm on, the, I'm, I'm on the queer spectrum as well. So it's like, okay, another thing to add to a very Christian household. Now I, I carry this. And then I, I go to K-State. K I, I become a little bit more confident in my blackness, confident in my voice, confident in my leadership capabilities. But now I get to corporate. 
And that's a whole different beast, right? So now it's like, okay, I, I conquered this. I still didn't conquer my sexuality. Um, I'm also, now I find myself um, uh, you basically filtering when I'm speaking. Oh, what did you do this weekend? I went on a couple of dates with a couple of women. But you know what? I just hung out at home. You know what I mean? Uh, and so I found myself filtering, and I just got tired of faking it. I got tired of carrying the shame. Um, and it, it was kind of like my voice got pulled out of me just because of being tired. And sometimes it's just simply of, this is exhausting. How exhausting it is to put up a, a front of something that you're not. Um, and then watching others kind of go through that same type of navigation process. We were, we've been close, and so watching my friends also deal with their challenges and, and trying to navigate new spaces. And so for me, it was like, okay, I'm not the only one dealing with this. I've conquered this. Um, and so since I'm tired of it, I have to do something about it. Like, I think about my new year, new me goals. So we all have them. And fun fact, only 10% of people um, actually fulfill their new year goal by the end of the year. I want to be one of those 10% of people. I may not be, but I'm going to, that's my goal. Um, but I think about the idea of I'm tired of feeling like I'm subpar in certain categories. And I just have to act on it. So for me, it, it was just like, okay, how do I navigate this space and not, no longer carry shame? Um, I, I don't know if anyone else, else can relate to this, um, but I always look to other people for, for validation. If it was a professor, how am I doing in this class? If it was a manager, are you sure I'm doing this right? I can do a poem and I can have a standing ovation. I go back to my seat. Did I, did I mess up? Like, what did you hear? You know what I mean? And that too, that, that idea of thinking negatively all the time, that can put a strain in your, on your body and your self-conscious, right? And so I'm reading this book right now that talks about um, how, it, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna butcher the name, but it's by Joseph Wynn. It's about how to control your thinking. Um, and it's so much negativity that, that we don't understand that we actually produce. That it may not even be the reality of the situation, it's just our mind telling us this or us being in a trance of just overthinking. And so for me, it's just like, I was tired of that. Like, I'm tired of overthinking about my being in every, every space. So, so this process and this journey, it's all about tired, being tired of being tired, you know what I mean? Um, and so now everything I do, I, I, again, I talk about this deepest intention because I have to ask myself, okay, in this moment when I'm feeling like this, why? And how do I operate in that instead of this, this skeleton of the show, something that I'm not? And this sounds like a really heavy, like, very heavy, but heavy real. process. <laughs> like, it's heavy for sure. Yeah. But I think it's also, we talk about this all, we've been friends for a decade now. Really? We talk about the excitement in that journey as well, the empowerment in that journey as well, uh, the foundations you bring, but also the people you bring along in the journey with you. Right, we talk about see, mm -hmm. looking at each other. Our, our careers mimicked each other for the longest time, and we have some of the similar friend group. But that journey is also super exciting, yeah. right? And yeah. so I don't want folks, when you're talking about navigating career spaces or going into corporate or going into your own business, to, to feel like, oh my God, it's going to be a fight every step of the way. It's going to be a fight every step of the way. <laughs> um, but that fight is so exciting when you look at it as that opportunity, right? I get to show up how I choose to show up, whatever authentic means to me. Yeah. And then I get to then use professionalism or use that as a leverage, use that as a tool, right, to grow and develop. And then the best part to me is I get to then bring people along the journey yeah. with me, right? It's a continuous evolution. Who I was at 18 is not who I am at 28, 29. <laughs> almost 30, <laughs> almost 30 paying Yikes. all my money in taxes right Yikes. now. Uh, we there can now. we talk about taxes for a there. second? We like, this is a, it's a, <laughs> girl, <laughs> there's a lot going on with my taxes. Um, but you get to bring people along on the journey with you, and I think it, it's heavy to have those conversations, especially navigating spaces that are new, but it's also super yeah. fruitful as well. And can I talk about this? Companies realize this, right? Company culture is shifting. I think uh, when I think about like my grandparents growing up, corporate looked different. But they realized there is definitely money to be made in allowing people to be themselves, to bring that uniqueness, bring that lens. Because I'm my whole, I'm a marketer. My entire job is trying to allow my brand to be attractive to you. How do they think? What do they like? And I don't know that talking to people that are like just like me, I don't know, I really don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still young, I'm 28, I'm not 29, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm still young. Why are you convincing yeah. <laughs> Convincing myself in the process. <laughs> but um, TikTok, like this whole thing with TikTok, I'm like, we're, 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 we're finally creating a, our brand on TikTok, we have our own TikTok, I'm just like, I don't know this world. I, I like to feel like I'm still hip, but I just don't know this world. So it's like, hip. I need people who just know TikTok on my team. Yeah. And, and it's like, <laughs> 
that part. I, I know they can help me. I know y'all can help me. But it's like companies realize that they're the most innovative and the most successful with diverse diversity. And that doesn't just look like race. That doesn't look like gender. It doesn't only look like gender. It also looks like thinking, how you were, how you were raised, how you were growing up, your experiences. So they can, we can monetize that. And not in a way that's like using you, it's telling you that you have a lot of power in just being you. You have a lot of value in just being you. And the, the moment that you feel like you're uncomfortable in a space because you can't be yourself, then that space may not be for you. One of the parts of, in the self-actualization process is to put down your values, but also the values in the spaces that you're trying to go into. So if that's a company, what is that company value? How does that align with mine? Because if you get into a company and it's a misalignment, you will be miserable. And like to Adonis's point, you wake up 30 years from now and say, wow, 25 years, I wish I could change some things. And I think that that will always be a little bit of, of a feeling, right? Like, dang, I could have done this, could have, should have, would have. But at the end of the day, you want to be really proud and confident in the decisions you make. So just find, find empowerment in the value you bring to organizations, you bring to spaces, you bring to relationships. And I want to be clear, too. I, I, we like to have fun, but we're business people at the end of the day, right? So what I mean by that, and I'm, I'm, I joke, I joke, I joke, but I, we look at uh, p &L statements. We look at analytics. I'm looking at North American data. I see the numbers. I see top line, bottom line. We're handling all the things that you would think happen in marketing yeah. strategy. And I will tell you, if you can align yourself to the personal and the emotional benefit that is aligned with authenticity, align yourself to the business benefit. And what I mean by that is I talk to marketing directors, I'm talking to VPs, I've talked to the Metas, the Amazons, and the Facebooks. And I say, if you can't align yourself with giving that empathy and finding that voice from an emotional standpoint, let's look at the numbers. If I myself as a consultant or I myself as a business leader can feel attached authentically to the work, can feel like I can show up in a way that makes sense to me and feels comfortable to me, I am going to produce a better output. Yeah. And for us, that output is so important. As a corporation, I love what I do. We love what we do. I've been in the business. I don't care about your process to get there, get there, get there efficiently, and give me an output. So when I go to these conversations and we talk about time and efficiency, and I don't know if I have the time to put into this, I don't know if I have the effort, I say, do you care about the dollars? Do mm -hmm. you care about the result? Your team is not inequipped. Your team is not uncapable. Yeah. Your team can do the work. But if they don't feel like they can show up and do that in a way that's authentic to them, or they feel like you haven't supported them in that journey to get there with all of the parameters and the things that you have going on, you will never get to your result. You will always miss goal, and you will never have an, any, you will never have an efficient team. Yeah. That time, from a corporate standpoint, is so incredibly important. 10, 15 minutes, 20 hours, whatever that looks like, there's a business bottom line to it that leads directly correlated to output. We can go through the numbers, this is public, you can view it on the site. It leads to higher output. Mm -hmm. So if I can't attach myself to the emotional journey of it, or if I can't attach myself to something that embodies something specifically in, in me, or I'm just not there on my journey, let me look at the business benefit, because every company likes to make mm -hmm. money, like, I want to make money. Um, and every company has, has a goal to reach. Yeah. And I'm in those conversations day in and day out. And I think that's something that you cannot miss is who I am authentically increases efficiency of business. You want to know how I know that? Because we're paying people to be them, mm -hmm. their authentic selves. Marketing campaigns, influencer programs, strategies around the dollars, monetary adjustments, all of those things are surrounded about people being themselves and there's dollars to be made in that space. And so I always like to, to be fun and fresh, right, and talk about emotional and, and people, but at the business base of it, there's a case to be made as well. Absolutely. So I'm gonna go off script from these questions. So, <laughs> so because you're, what you've just talked about, Adonis, reminds me of a recent Harvard Business Review article where they talked about how 80% of businesses on their website, they make the business case for diversity and inclusion. But what they found in their research as, is for um, diverse candidates, so people who identify with some underrepresented group, that making that business case on the website doesn't feel good and we hmm. are more likely to actually feel like we don't belong. What actually works is making the fairness case. So we create a, like a, a, a culture where everybody is treated equitably, where they feel like they belong. And talking about that, about a space where we want people to be authentically themselves, mm. that actually 
um, is more effective at helping candidates feel like that's a place for me. Oh my God. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. What do you, do, do you, do you agree with that? Like, would you? Yeah, I would say I agree with the fact of talent attraction yeah. of this idea that I'm not just a number for your business statistic, yeah. for your results. Yeah. I am going to add value in something outside of my identity. Because sometimes, yeah. you know, I ask this question all the time because I do speak for a lot of DNI um, spaces and initiatives for on the behalf of my company. Are you tired of always being that token? And I think I mentioned it in the poem. I'm, this, my common sense may be tired of being your token, and, and sometimes that's true. Sometimes. It, it, it feels like a plight to carry the weight of a whole group of people um, and having to speak on behalf of that and advocate for that. And that's why we need allies to also navigate this, that space and also um, be a, a listener and also an a activator as well. Um, so I do think that changing that messaging for people who are looking for employment is, is crucial. But I do, at the same time, as Adana says, there are people leaders that may not get it. Um, and it could, it could be because they come from a different generation or maybe don't have that same emotional connection. They can't, why are we talking about this in business? I've, I've seen people say that, like, this stay woke culture, why are we, no, we should fo focus on just results. And so you have to paint a picture of how talking about this leads to this type of result, right? If you want to stay relevant in this marketplace, you have to talk about this. You have to learn how to navigate this space. And so I think that I, I agree with it, but I agree with it for a certain and a particular audience. And I think there's a, there's a belief that they can exist in tandem, mm -hmm. right? I think there is such a, a, a great conversation around equity, right? We, we love that conversation, pay, pay transparency. Yeah. We, we love equity, but at the same time, there's a push for disaggregated data, yeah. period. And so uh, we, we deal with that every day in the business that we handle. That data is so important because I want to make sure that I'm not just a number. I want to make sure that I can actually see the work that you're doing. And to Justice's point and what we're seeing in our pipeline, if I can read the story myself, I'm not looking for you to tell me. So mm -hmm. that tells me that you're being forthright and honest. And so in the industry, I'm in, in, in tech, on the tech consulting side, there's such a push, disaggregate that data and give it to me. So we're gonna do that. There's also a push of, I need to make sure that I'm not just a number and where's yeah. the equity and both things can exist at the same time. And that's also incredibly subjective because how you receive data and information and how you receive a story, we could be sitting telling the same story and I receive it in a different way. I'm offended and she's not offended. Yeah. So all things considered, subjective. But yeah. disaggregated data will always win and the equity story will always win and those two things can live at the same time. And that's a reality for when we have this conversation about our authenticity and then we talk about business. Like it's impossible to please everyone, right? I've seen a lot of headwinds in my own organization, and it's like, dang, there's a group of people that are still upset, right? And even with myself, like, I could make someone uncomfortable and offended by me just showing up. And so I think the reality is when we set expectations and manage that accordingly, it's, it's going to be hard to please everyone, but the goal is to find that, that balance um, and also do what's inherently, inherently right. But to, the subjectivity piece is, is super important because if you try to please everyone in every space, it's, it would be very difficult. It's very, yeah, very difficult at all. So, yeah. so I have two more questions and then I'll let you have your final thoughts and then we're gonna ask the audience for their questions. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at okay. um, with time. So could you talk about some of the resources that you found helpful in helping you navigate the workplace, whether it's employee resource groups or your community? Um, what has been helpful for you? That's a good question. Great question. That's a like, great I, question, I, Diane. I, have uh, <clears throat> I would say uh, what has been helpful. The resources that I've used, I think, we talk about friendship, we talk about community. I think that it was really important to see others in the same space as me that looked like me. So I'm gonna be honest, in my community, my friend group, who are also, whether they're working for the same company or not, having that, that just space to be able to just let go and like, let's talk about it, let's vent. Um, so that was important. And then also watching how my peers, who also would see as mentors to a certain degree, watching how they, how they navigated um, through life, whatever fashion that may be. So that was an important resource for me. Um, mentors that have been in, in business um, for, for longer than me, so maybe they have 10 years on me, so I can like, 
uh, be able to bounce things off of their head. I'm really big on having a, a, a mentor and a sponsor. Um, the mentor is more of the, the peer that's closer in age, have a little bit of ex more experience than you, but they're, they're closer to you. Um, you can a little bit be, you know, a little bit more open with it. You have a sponsor who's in spaces and in, in, in rooms that you're not in that's advocating on your behalf. So I think that has been an important resource. And just hearing that, I, I say don't seek the validation, but hearing that affirmation, like, okay, I'm doing right. Okay, you, you have something that I, you know, maybe I wasn't exposed to, exposed, exposed to before. You're helping me with this. And then I think the last would be, um, for me, the employer resource groups. Um, I was super involved um, in our black ERG in my company, um, and having that safe space was super helpful in my journey. Yeah, I would say most of the same things for me, having the proper community, creating that community, which could be hard. But also something that's so strategically important is I have a really best friend. Her name is Justine Floyd. She's uh, an alum of the College of Ag. Um, and she's my best friend, sure, but she's also my business accountability partner. And so we share a career in terms of every day we're debriefing. How'd it go? Talk to me about your meetings. What's happening? And she, we've gotten so keen. We've been friends for now 11 years almost. We've gotten so keen to be able to call out actions that we've done that negate who we are as people. Mm. Um, I took a job. Uh, I, I, I moved for everything, right? I saw a dollar sign and I was like, let's ride. <laughs> Let's ride. Um, and I remember immediately when I presented her with, I'm like, this, this opportunity is great. The first thing she said, that goes against everything that you are. Hmm. Everything that you said you wanted, everything that you were planning for, that goes against all of that. So I will support you in the decision that you're making, but I'm going to call it out that it goes against who you are authentically. I'm going to be with you with, if it doesn't go well. Uh, I'm hoping that it does, but I want to call it out to you. That, that that's not authentic to you or in relationships or in anything, having that accountability partner, someone who is incredibly honest mm -hmm. and incredibly objective to call it out when it doesn't feel right and when it doesn't seem right. Now it's then up to you to have the maturity and the honesty to digest that and take that and do something with that information, but also understand building that trusting partner the other thing is, um, we talked about allyship and sponsorship, but building very, very close connections with folks and allies that are really trailblazing in the space at my organization or my company. Mm -hmm. Because I want to get into the mind of somebody that is not in my seat, right? What are you seeing? What are you doing? And also, I'm a key proponent of getting into the rooms I wouldn't normally have access to. That is so big for me. My, I get into rooms that I should not be in, Partially because I'm nosy and probably <laughs> breaking a lot of rooms, but I want to understand the narrative. Mm -hmm. And I can't get to that narrative because I don't act, have access to that room. You know who does have access to that room? Senior Vice President. Mm -hmm. You know who does have access to that room? ERG co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. You know who does have access to that room? The people making the decisions about my, my career and my life and, and being able to, to make those connections authentically with them, honest connections, hearing from them, being their sounding board, an executive that it's one of my favorite people, we'll talk about her later, but one of my favorite people at Hormel called me into her office, senior, senior leadership, and she goes, because you were always there, I want you on my board of directors as a diversity partner for me. And in return, I'm going to get you into those rooms and build that strategy with you. And I think that has been so important for me, not to just elevate my career because my career has been great, but as I mentioned before, bringing folks along on the journey with you so all the fight that we've been doing, they don't have to do that fight. Mm -hmm. all, all the conversations we've been having, all the struggles that we went through, they don't have to do that. And it's not just me yelling up, it's them yelling across and mm -hmm. yelling down and mm -hmm. yelling through. That's and I good. think that's an important, important thing that has helped me in getting into those rooms, but also preparing me for, for what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. so, so those would be most important, having an accountability partner and then locking arms with those allies that are at the levels to make decisions and get you in the rooms that you wouldn't normally have access to. Absolutely. That's excellent. And what I, what I, as you were both talking, I was thinking about the opportunities that we have for a lot of the students in the room, right, that creates these opportunities for you. So we have a really amazing executive mentor program if, if you all haven't heard about it. So as they're talking about the importance of mentors, people who are in that job that you want to be in, we literally have a program that can match you with somebody that's literally in that job that you're looking for. And what we're also working on is is recruiting of a diverse, broad 
identity group for these executive mentors because, so for example, for me, if I'm interested in having a mentor, yes, maybe I want them to have this particular job or be in this particular industry, but if they're also an Asian woman, that then we're going to be able to have conversations about our experiences that I may not be able to have authentically with somebody else just simply because we don't have the same experiences, right? And so... Um, Brianna Williams right here. <laughs> she actually runs our executive mentor program. And so I just wanted to point that out because we are trying to give people those direct connections and that help. And then the other thing I was thinking about with your accountability partner, I also have an accountability partner okay. and it is so helpful, it's right? So Cause I will procrastinate till the last <laughs> Girl, second, I'm a mess. Yeah. right? I'm a mess. Right. And yeah. so, and if I can't regulate myself <laughs> and my goals, like let me find somebody else who cares about me and loves me me and wants me to succeed yeah, and the same reverse like I want them to succeed so then we're just holding each other accountable because in life like we just we love each other right and people who love you and care about you your best friends yeah. in the whole world they want you to be successful hopefully. so <laughs> I mean hopefully otherwise I mean are they your real friends that part. Get rid <laughs> right of them. can I, get echo, rid you of them. Can I echo you please get involved in the executive mentorship program that existed while we were here I did not do it I failed to do it. Our president and CEO of Megamax Foods, he's a mentor in that program. He gets so excited. He's super invested. And the fact, the, the way he goes above and beyond for his mentee is mind-blowing. And I wish I would have got involved in that. Please take advantage of the free resources you have access to on campus because it will be a point in time in life where those resources are no longer free. and You would have to pay for them or go above and beyond to get them. So please, please, please. I want to echo You're going to be paying like $150 for a resume review after <laughs> you graduate. Or a business coach. A business coach. coach so. I, I also want to say when these events happen or mm -hmm. when these conversations happen, pay attention to the faculty that are in the room. Pay attention Absolutely. to the faculty that show up. Not There's calendars and things. I understand people have classes to teach. But just pay attention who's in the room, right? Yeah. Who's wanting to learn and invest and have those conversations. Why that's so important is because that is a launching pad for Absolutely. additional conversations to be had. And I think we often forget to take a look around because we're so introspective. Mm -hmm. Who's in the room, Yeah. right? Who can I have a conversation with? Who can I tap into? And we always struggle with how do I network, right? How do I get out there? I was an introvert at, at one point. I am no longer an introvert. <laughs> um, but at one point in time, it was so hard because I'm yeah. like, how do I connect? But paying attention to who's showing up and yeah. these type of yeah. conversations, you kind of start understanding where your safe spaces might be. Sure and where you can have those conversations. So um, if it's difficult for you to network or difficult for you to step out, just be cognizant of who you always see showing up and understanding that that could be the same experience for them showing yeah. up for yeah. you and vice versa. And I will say the faculty member piece is, is huge. I would not be in the seat if it wasn't for a faculty member in the College of Business. I did not kill the Hormel interview. A faculty member was advocating on my behalf. Just putting it out there. If you're, you know, if you're like, How, I need an internship, I need this. Be involved with, with the College of Business and build a relationship with the faculty member who, who is advocating for you. It's super huge and important. Yeah. yeah. So I want to ask, so the, this, this panel is called Authenticity at Work. And so I'd love to just hear your sort of closing thoughts, anything that you didn't get a chance to say that you want to say or that you want to um, sort of leave the audience with. And then as you're following, as you're finishing that up, if... Be, if folks have questions, there are uh, microphones on each side, and so you can just kind of make your way over there. So final, final thoughts. Mine is extremely simple. Um, enjoy and want to enjoy how you show up. That's so important, um, not just to produce a good output, but that's great, but just to feel good, right? Mm -hmm. I can do the work and I can do it well, but if I don't feel good doing it, it there's not a meaning to it, there's yeah. not a value to it, I'm just doing it to do it. And one thing my parents always say is if you're just gonna do it to do it, that's a half-assed done. Yeah. It, it, it honestly is done. If you're just doing it to do it, it's half-assed because you don't enjoy it, you're not authentic to it, you didn't bring yourself to it, there's no personality with it, it's not fun, it's something that I can go to the store and buy, it's the same thing that I've seen. But as soon as you tap into who I am authentically and how that shows up in what I'm doing, there's just a fun about it. 
right? You could be having the worst day or this, it's hard. What we do is difficult work, but I enjoy how I show up to do it. And I think that makes it that much easy, easier, especially as you're starting a career or sustaining a career, is enjoy, enjoy how you show up, not to impress other people or so other people can think you're authentic, but just for your own self, because it feels good. Mm -hmm. And it makes you want to show up and it makes you want to continue to do what you do day in and day out for the next 30 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So try that. I would say trust the process. If I remember being in your seats, I was not authentic whatsoever. I wasn't there yet, but you'll get there. Trust the process. I know we, we, we spend four years trying to figure out what feels like a lifetime, and that's a lot of pressure on ourselves in four years to figure out what we want to do, where we want to go, where we want to live, what kind of career I want to have. I don't even know about this company, but like I'm, I'm expected to know all the answers to the questions. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Trust the process. If you're not like, hey, Adonis and Justice, I hear you, but I, I'm still trying to figure out who I am. You know, I'm still hiding certain parts of myself. Trust the process. Trust the, We spend so much time overthinking that we forget the present moment and we miss moments that are right in front of us. Right, those daily affirmations, right, that's happening all around us. Trust the process. It's going to work itself out. You will be all right. You're already doing a step, uh, a step further by being here. Right, so just trust the process. One so, more thing, yeah. I'm going to leave you with. Um, <laughs> I, I just said this to a friend. You've got enough time to do exactly what you were put on this earth to do. Absolutely. Remember that. Mm -hmm. You have enough time to do exactly what your purpose to do. Figuring that out is its own thing, but you've got enough time. Right, so don't try to rush the process because I promise you, whatever your, your purpose is, you've got enough time to figure that out. Yep. I love that. We don't have to have it all figured. I mean, I don't have it all figured out. <laughs> Girl, we, you don't process. have to have it all figured out. One yeah. step at a Daily time, time right? It's 150,000 One... emails in my inbox. Right now. <laughs> oh. So I, I always say um, every day, every week, every year, just try to get a little bit closer to your ideal life, whatever that is for you. And that ideal life is going to change as you get older. If you have a family, things will happen in your life. But if you consider and just really think about what is an ideal life for you, for you, for you it's going to be different. For you, it's going to be different for mm -hmm. me, right? And nobody can create that life except for you. And nobody can, be, can choose to be authentic in those spaces except for you. We have a question. First, I wanted to say being a non-traditional student and being in multiple corporate aspects, I 100% agree with you and racing to a 20, 30 year career to get to the top and authentically, is it, it's not how you want to do it. Just know from experience. Additionally, what is your best um, advice or direction that you would give to younger folks that are, you know, walking away from college here soon that maybe are introverted or don't know how to take that first step of talking with leadership and are they gonna be looked at differently if they question? You know, a lot of times in corporate world, you question the wrong person and then you're looked at, you know, um, wrong, you know, or, or don't do that. It's, it's very cut and dry, you know, here's your roadmap and here's how to get to the top. How do you diversify from that um, and, you know, stray, stray from the wagon, really? It's a great question. Thanks for asking that question. Um, because I have a lot of close friends who are introverts. And when we get up here and we talk about navigating certain spaces and speaking of and being ourselves, you automatically, shoot, I have to be an extrovert. 100% 100% not true. Sometimes, oftentimes, the smartest people in the room are the people who are not saying a lot. They speak when they have a wise thing to say. Um, so I think my advice uh, to introverts, but to any, everyone, I, I think at, at certain points we have to get pushed out of our comfort zone. And that's just natural, right? Um, extroverts, that, comfort, the, the uncomfortability could look like, hey, you gotta be quiet sometimes. You gotta know, you can't over talk. You know, we have all those people in those business meetings that just talk to hear themselves talk. Just take a breather for a second. Hey, introverts, it might be okay. I don't have to talk to everyone in the room, but the connections that I, I do need to speak to, let me make sure that they're meaningful. So maybe it's pushing yourself, okay, I, I'm at this awkward networking event. There's like 30 people talking about the KU versus K-State game that K-State won in, you know what I mean? Or Chiefs about to win, to the, win the Super Bowl coming up, or whatever it is. Just, just find that one person, um, that one or two people, push yourself, all right? Maybe it's one person in this event, the next event is might be another one, right? So I would say 
Um, just push yourself out of your comfort zone. Uh, comfort zone. I would say focus on that elevator pitch as well. I think we, in the college of business, they were talking about elevator speech, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. And so I would say learn that and just use that as a conversation starter. And then the biggest thing is a lot of people like talking about themselves. So if you are an uh, introvert, just learn um, how to ask questions really well. And then you'll be surprised at how far just asking a question, a couple of questions to two or three folks in the room will get you. Um, they'll remember that, oh, you, you wanted to know about myself. You, you didn't just talk to, talk to me to tell me more about you. You actually listened. So that would be my advice to the introverts in the room. Thanks for asking that, too. Yeah. Should I? Okay. Is this close? OK. <laughs> I didn't want to. I really liked what you said about the accountability partner, and I guess Olivia is literally mine. Like, she's very honest with she's me. She's mine, too. <laughs> yeah, like, she's so honest with me, and I love you. <laughs> so thank you for that. It really made me appreciate that. Um, but I've been reading this book. It's called The Untethered Soul, and it talks a lot about consciousness. Have you read it? I haven't read it, but I've heard of it. Yeah. It's so good. But it talks a lot about consciousness. Let's start a book club. I should, I yeah. should. <laughs> but um, I was kind of like discovering that within myself. I feel like in my life so far, I haven't been very conscious. And so I guess my question to you is like, if you could go back and do something differently, like what would you do differently? Or like, that's very broad because not really like only work wise, just like you yourself too. Like how, what would you do differently? Uh, the one thing that I would do uh, is be present more in my life. <clears throat> that, that would be the one thing that I would do. Um, my career and my life move like this, right? I'm a tourist, so it's yes or it's no, and I move very quickly, and I forget to be present. Um, and I actually have a tattoo. My dad always says this, but it says, be still, be present. Oh, um, and so I got that tattoo when I went on a sabbatical, um, and it reminds me every time to pulse check. Like, you will never have this same day again. You will never have this same feeling again. Um, it'll change and it'll be different, but you live it once. And so how happy would you be if you were just present in that moment? And I wish that I could go back and be present in our days together and be present in those times growing up and be present in that, but I don't, I don't uh, throw that away. I, I'm appreciative of the journey, but moving forward, I pulse check, how am I feeling today? This is a good day, like let me take a snap, or I feel like shit today, like this is a terrible day. <laughs> Right, um, but I, I wish I would be more present in my life, and I wish we all would take time to be more present in everyday life. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, I want to apologize. I got here a couple minutes late. You may have answered this already, but uh, what are you guys' uh, voices? Because we learned in class about the five voices. I was curious what, what your guys' voices were. Five have we done the five voices with you? Sure. I don't know if we've done them together. OK, OK. <laughs> so. Which one is like irate? Like, which one is like So, <laughs> OK. Which one is like chaotic? That's okay, OK, so I, I think that you're creative. So I'm also creative, creative connector. So creatives are very innovative. They're very. I know you said like you have to remind yourself to stay in the present and appreciate the moment. Keep your mind where your feet are. Creatives, we're always thinking about the future and we're innovating. Connectors always want to um, put people together. Someone who needs this. Oh, I got somebody who, who could help you with, with that. Um, nurturers. Nurturers are very quiet, as you're talking about introverts. <laughs> nurturers are not the first ones to, to speak, but as you said, as you said, Justice, they have, they may be the smartest people in the room, right? They might be the smartest people in the room. Um, so those are three of them. Fourth is guardian. Guardians are all about data. I remember this. Do you remember what this? What else? All about data. Oh, data. They, I don't yep. know. And processes. I don't, I don't know. know. Last, last one is pioneer. Know. Pioneers are strategic thinkers. They, um, they can put the right people and the resources all together and just have this vision. Is there like a Neapolitan option? Yeah. <laughs> I would take that. Yep. I don't know. Because mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm sorry, that's not a good answer. So you, yeah. so you can bring me in to your friend group or down to your companies and we'll do the five voices with you. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. okay. Remember well, what you I wish we had an answer. Yeah. I'm sorry. We'll let you know, James. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, TBD. thank you. TBD. 
Yeah. Now but you gave me homework. I know. Now <laughs> you have Melissa. homework. Girl, I graduated. <laughs> okay. Now you got to take this I assessment, uh, right? No. Okay. So I'll just I'll just mention. Um, I learned about the five voices when I was in a cohort of um, Asian American professionals. And it was the very first time in my life that I have been in a room, it was a Zoom room, of course, but been in a room with only Asian people. And it was, I didn't know what I had been missing. I did not know what I had been missing, okay? And so that was really, really special and powerful to me. And talking and learning about the five voices and thinking about how has our, our Asian culture influenced how we show up, can we be authentic in a space or have we been influenced by our culture, by our family, by the culture that we live in but is we don't per personally identify with? That's been, it was really helpful for the self-reflection, which is what you've been talking about today. We pocket. are unfortunately out of time today. So could we give Adonis and Justice a big hand? Help me thank them. Thank you. I'm over here talking to you. Everybody say good job. Thank you so much for being here. And if there are folks who have questions for them, you'd like to hang out, um, we may have a couple minutes for that if you just want to come down to the front. Thank you so much.